When people call for censorship, they often argue that offensive speech is harmful to the vulnerable and oppressed. But the reality is that a system of robust and uninhibited free speech is actually an oppressed person's strongest weapon. Oppressed and marginalized minorities, by definition, have little political power. Powerful majorities that are allowed to implement restrictions on speech will inevitably do so in a way that guards the status quo from dissent and disruption. This is why our founders considered the right to free speech so important that they purposely took that power away. Granting majorities the authority to determine when speech is harmful and to censor it only invites further oppression, and you don't need to look too far back in history to see how that plays out. In 1835, abolitionists mailed over 100,000 anti-slavery pamphlets to slaveholders in the South. This led to violence by slaveholders against abolition advocates and those seen as interfering with slavery. In a letter to his colleague, Postmaster General Amos Kendall described the pamphlets as, quote, incendiary missiles intended to inflame. He went so far as to say that it was patriotic to suppress them in order to protect their local communities. Within weeks, postmasters had barred abolitionist pamphlets from the mail, and many communities passed laws banning such literature outright. Censorship of civil rights advocacy continued during the civil rights movement of the 1950s and the 1960s. Student protesters in South Carolina and Louisiana were arrested for disturbing the peace, not because they were violent, but because their opponents were. Eventually, the Supreme Court overturned these convictions on the ground that a listener's reaction to the student's advocacy could not be used to punish or silence an unpopular point of view. But the abolitionist and civil rights movements are not the only causes to have suffered the sting of censorship. Women in the 19th century who wished to publish often had to write under male pen names, and women suffragists faced arrest as they picketed and demonstrated for their right to vote. Lesbian and gay activists have seen their literature and art prohibited as obscenity, preventing them for decades from integrating themselves into the culture and norms of American society. High school students have faced obstruction from administrators when they have sought to establish gay-straight alliance clubs. In 1985, Texas A&M University refused to grant recognition to the Gay Student Services Club, with the Board of Regents taking the position that, quote, so-called gay activities run diabolically counter to the traditions and standards of the Texas A&M University. A federal appellate court later ruled that the university's actions violated students' First Amendment rights. In overturning the convictions of the civil rights protesters in the 60s, the Supreme Court reminded us that dispute is a function of free speech, and that free speech, quote, may indeed best serve its high purpose when it induces a condition of unrest, creates dissatisfaction with conditions as they are, or even stirs people to anger. The American experience has shown that sentiment to be indisputably accurate. All of these movements have been remarkably successful, and the world is a far different place as a result. Minority groups have caused huge cultural shifts and have gained legal equality at a relatively rapid pace. History is stocked with ideas like these that began as offensive and heretical, but ultimately fought their way to acceptance. Some of them even became the cultural and societal status quo themselves. But this societal change is only possible through the power of persuasion, which in turn relies on a system in which ideas can be freely expressed and debated without official censorship. Gay rights and free speech advocate Jonathan Rauch calls this a system of liberal science, where defensible truths survive rigorous checking through public discourse and criticism, and ideas found unworthy can be discarded. Others call this system the marketplace of ideas. But no matter what you call it, it's the only system that ensures the continuous testing of the status quo and allows us to explore new and innovative ideas for moving forward. Had the powers that be been allowed to silence advocates of abolition, civil rights, women's suffrage, and gay rights, our democracy would look much different today. Who knows what important changes we would stifle if we don't learn from our past. Finally, it's important to remember that if you aren't aware of your surroundings, you can't adequately guard yourself from danger. Driving certain ideas or thoughts underground does nothing to eliminate them, and preventing them from being expressed only robs us of an opportunity, an opportunity to not only persuade them, but also to be aware of our own surroundings. As FIRE co-founder and chairman Harvey Silverglate said when defending the rights of a neo-Nazi group, if there are Nazis in the room, I want to know who they are so that I can keep an eye on them.